God says, in a time to come, in Jeremiah 31, when the desolate land blooms again, many of the Jewish people have returned. And Jerusalem has been rebuilt. God will make a new covenant with the Jewish people. The land lay desolate from the time Rome destroyed the second temple and the Jewish people were dispersed uh, primarily throughout Europe but eventually the world. But after the Holocaust, 1948, they created the state of Israel, now considered a country. So this is, this is the day that the new covenant is here. But how does it get announced? Now, the first covenant between God and the Israelites was basically, if you do all of my commandments, all of my laws, abide by everything that I tell to Moses and Moses gives to you, and you all agree to this, then I will be your God and you will be my people. Well, in this new covenant, he repeats that. It's really just an amendment which can be found in the discussion of that can be found in these videos. But the most important part is how are the Jewish people to recognize this new Moses? This, who, who's going to deliver it to them? It's here. It's supposed to be here. The new covenant is, is supposed to be in place and it includes sin forgiveness. God forgives the sins of the Jewish people just as he did the Assyrian Babylonian exiles and as a holy seed they built the second temple. Well there's another temple to be built and once again God's forgiven the sins and he says this will cause Torah to be written on your heart which is a metaphor for the people are going to come back to Judaism in droves and start studying and be more learned in the Torah. It's just a metaphor. And everyone shall heed him. Well, with the new covenant, there's only two that have not been delivered in the Hebrew Bible. It's the covenant of friendship and this new covenant. Well, the covenant of friendship comes with Mashiach, the descendant of David. Or he's present, and when he is, God grants this new covenant. It is also said to be the start of the Messianic era. I have a video on that. Um, you should. <laughs> I, I think the day of the Lord is more important. And in the day of the Lord, which he announces prophetically in Malachi 3, in the very first verse, he says, I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and I shall return to my temple suddenly. The angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Okay, there's a lot to that. Why, why is this angel of the covenant already on the way? Clearly, that is the new covenant of Jeremiah. And we have a man who doesn't have identification. No, there's no description of him. Elijah is the messenger. But God has to have somebody. Somebody like Moses, and he says, one day, I'm going to send a prophet like Moses. Again, no description. So we have four men coming, the Moshiach, the sending of David, no description, although the sages and rabbis of the Talmud believed he was described in Isaiah 53. They called him the leper scholar. Just because of the verses. He's a man of suffering familiar with disease, but he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. Christianity believes that describes Jesus Christ. And that's what you'll find in just about all these videos. God has passed his wrath to Christianity in Isaiah 51. He tells the Jews, I'm taking my cup of wrath, my bowl of reeling from you, 
and I'm passing it to those who told you to get down on the ground and walked all over you. That's Christianity. They took their book. They tell the Jews that they don't understand their own book, that it is prophetic of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, and that it describes Jesus Christ. And I disagree with that vehemently. But that is, that's the whole point of this day of the Lord. He's got to have a man. There's four men that he's sending, Elijah, sending a David that he calls David, Elijah, David, the prophet like Moses, and the righteous servant. Now he has a description. And all three of these other men were righteous and they were servants of God. We have one description. It is implicit that God intended that man to have the attributes and capabilities of all four men. One description, four men. Isaiah 53 describes the man God is going to use in the day of the Lord. He wasn't supposed to come before that. Certainly doesn't fit the time of Jesus. See a time to come. The land has to have laid desolate for it to bloom again. The land wasn't desolate in the days of Jesus. God says, I'm returning to my temple in the days of Jesus. God was in his temple and the, and because the temple was there. None of it applies. So that's, that's what the Jewish people are looking for today. They're looking for the man of Isaiah 53. He's not the Jewish people, as Judaism teaches today, as one man Israel. He's certainly not Jesus Christ. He's just a man living at this time in the time to come. The Jews, it, it's very simple. God says to his chosen, when you return, I will return. Because he knew what Rome was going to do. He knew they were going to be dispersed. It's called the diaspora, away from Israel. And he knew they'd come back. I have written two books. The first book is Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord. It covers everything I'm talking about and much, much more. And there's a sequel to it. The Life of the Righteous Servant of God of Isaiah 53. It's a chronicle of my life. That God, as he had Moses write the Torah, dictated to me. He's my ghostwriter of my autobiography and it focuses in primarily on everything that happened to my life that has me fit every verse of Isaiah 53. He came to me basically as Jeremiah would say in the womb. But instead of making me a godly man he made sure I fit these verses, a man of suffering, a man of sorrow, a sinner. As an atheist for 50 years, he made sure I didn't associate with anybody, with anybody that was religious. I've never had any training. All of my knowledge comes from him. And when you read these books and you take all that into consideration, you'll know what the Orthodox Jews know. There's no way Moses wrote those books, the first five, the Torah, on his own. And there is absolutely no way I wrote these two books on my own. It's just not possible. I have far too much knowledge. I have knowledge that the great Jewish sages and rabbis, their intellectual commentary uh, people, don't even have a clue about. They, they have no clue. What a man in divine beings is, for instance. That the Holy Spirit is a person, for instance. What a Lord, what, what a host of the Lord's host is, for instance. God's way of communicating with the world. And a lot of that is because he wanted it that way. He knew what they were going to come up with. He knew where Judaism would be in the day of the Lord. 
He put a lot of these things like the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit in Ezekiel. I mean, Isaiah 63, he didn't, he didn't put it in the Torah where he knew they'd get hold of it. Uh, a host of the Lord's host. You find that in Joshua, you know, the sixth book. It's not Torah. And, um, of course, Jacob did wrestle with a, an angel. I mean, that's what they say. But that's not what Jacob says, whose name was changed to Israel. That's not what Jacob says. He says, I wrestled with a man in divine beings. Any man that the Spirit of God alights upon, such as the descendant of David, in Isaiah chapter 11, is going to be a man in divine beings because God is in his spirit. And there's videos on that already. This is only the fourth. I've got three videos out. I'm getting ready to uh, upload another one. But it's, it's all in the books. Every question you have, and every time you read it, understand, I've never had any training. I've never associated with religious people. Uh, it's just never been a part of my life until I was 50 years old. But here is, here's the last thing I'm going to say on it. You can find the books at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com. This is the last thing I'm going to say on it. Isaiah 53 has got one verse that nobody can match. Nobody can fit except the man himself. God chooses to crush him with disease so that he will offer himself for guilt and he might be given long life and see his children and by his knowledge he makes the many who become a multitude righteous by his knowledge. How do you know if a man's offered himself for guilt? Well, how about a man who's crushed with disease and receives long life? I had colon cancer quite a while back. It was very severe. I should have died from it. But they were able to extract it, a dangerous surgery, because I had been shot through the abdomen when I was 18, and I had been opened up from stem to stone. And they had to go back and do it again to get this uh, incredibly large tumor that had burst through my colon. I was bleeding internally. I mean, I couldn't even get up to go see a doctor anymore. I was dying in an apartment. But the planes hit New York. That's how long ago I'm talking about. And it just inspired me to try one more thing. I got a colonoscopy and they found the tumor. I had been trying to find out why I couldn't eat why I had such a severe pain in my belly for months after month, and I was just wasting away. But they got it, and I took the chemo for it, and colon cancer has never come back. But when I finished the uh, chemo, they ran more tests. I came back in to see them, and they're shaking their heads, bad news. I said, it wasn't there. They said, your lungs, and they showed me the pictures. They said, you see those white spots? That's cancer. That's cancer we can't treat. It's so advanced. I said, well, what does that mean? You're not going to treat it. They said, you're going to die, and you're going to die real soon. Now, if you study lung cancer and you see a stage 4 lung cancer, you're going to find out that people don't live more than a year. With good treatment, maybe five. That's the way, that's what I read on the internet. And... I have never seen a doctor again. From that day, when they told me that, that was it. It crushed me. I stopped working. Uh, I was just walking around in that daze every day, waiting to die. But uh, that was 20 years ago. God crushed me with disease, and he has since told me I did it. And he said, you know when it started? I said, that around when I got shot. He said, yeah. He said, I had everything in the world to do with that. And in my power, I gave you that cancer. And in my power, I prevented you from dying. You no longer have it. I removed it from your lungs. That's why you never have any symptoms. That's why you've been a triathlete running half Ironmans, going eight straight hours, training every day with nary a problem, because I did it. And then he had to teach me the scripture. 
I had never read the Bible. He said, uh, let's go to the bookstore. His spirit had entered into me as a, as a baby just to monitor my life. And he's in his spirit. Again, I've already discussed that in other videos. And the book is more detailed. And so, a man of divine things just... <laughs> There's three persons in this body. The person of God, the person of the Holy Spirit, who is the angel of the presence, who is the angel who brings the covenant. And I am to announce it. And, quite, and I do in those books. When they're published, that's the formal announcement, whether anybody wants to read it or not. The announcement that the new covenant is here. The covenant of friendship is here. So these videos and those books, which I could not have written, are my proofs, and I promise you, they are so far greater than the proofs God gave Moses to convince 600,000 Israeli men, slaves, and their families to follow him out of Egypt. I'm not talking about all the miracles. I'm talking about what he had to approach them with. He said to God, who am I that they would listen to me? And then... You can find this in the Torah. I guess it's in Genesis or Exodus. Um, that's what all this is about. God said he was going to do this. He's doing it. The Jewish people have a different idea of what happens when the descendant of David comes. I've explained why it's wrong. I've explained that things that cannot happen, prophecies that cannot happen in the real world, you have to come up with another answer. God had multiple purposes. He wrote some of those verses they rely on. Just for the people of antiquity. They were illiterate. It was a society of ignorance. They like children. They like to be told stories. They like to feel good too. They wanted to hear that people were going to live to be over 100 years old. A man of 100 years will be thought of but as a child. Phrases like that, the Jewish people today take, take to heart and say, well, that's going to happen. These bodies don't last a thousand, a hundred years, which would mean if you're a child, 10,000 years. They, you know, we're supposed to know. We went, we went into the age of enlightenment, science, medicine, knowledge, and today the internet. You can learn anything you want to learn. They're still praying for the resurrection of the dead, the Orthodox Jews, because it's the 13th fundamental uh, principle of the fundamentalist uh, of Judaism. Do they have any idea? You had a million people basically leave in the Exodus. You had six million in the Holocaust alone. There's, that's... That's 7 million. That's how many Jewish Israelis there are today. And, that, and what about from the time the first group got to Egypt, they were there 400 years, everybody that died. Those that came back, those in the promise, those in the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, what are you going to do with those people? What's the government of Israel going to do? Can you even fit them into Israel? There's so many millions of people you're talking about. No, they, they had no food, no money, no clothes, no shelter. <laughs> they can't read. You've got some savage people in there that still will be eating meat raw. They see a dead squirrel in the street, they're going to go pick it up and nibble on it. <laughs> it's that bad. It's an impossibility. And yet, and then they ask themselves, how come nobody's coming to our How come the young people aren't coming to our synagogues? I've got news for you. They're very real. This generation is very real. They came up on the internet. They came. They they have learned about uh, fake news and people trying to trick you and people telling you things are going to happen that don't happen or something did happen and it didn't. And on and on and on. You, I have three children. They're in the thirties. They're all married. I got a couple grandchildren, but. It's, my, it's part of my job is to draw them to Judaism. 
And God gave me a hand. He said, here's the amendment. Tell them to be mindful of my teachings to Moses that horrible of my <coughs> commandments and laws and rules. Be mindful. And that's for everybody to take it to heart as they want to. With how they believe and practice. And ultra orthodox, mindful might be something entirely different from a conservative or for an orthodox. It's for each individual. But practice Judaism. You know, the basics. Celebrate Shabbat. Don't work on Saturday. Go to the high holidays, particularly even though everybody is sin free. You don't want the incline, evil inclination to get you. You've got a clean slate. Respect God for forgiving your sins. Now, He wants you to be a holy city to build the third temple, like the exiles built the second one. But once you hear this message, you're on your own to keep your slate clean. And that would mean go to Yom Kippur and keep your slate clean. Do as many mitzvahs as you can handle every day. That's my job. That's my task. And if I fail, if I can't get the people to recognize me in my capacity as Elijah, the righteous servant of God, he says when he comes, and basically he's saying, if that temple's not there for me, or it's not going to be built, and of course he would know, I'm coming with utter destruction to the land. And what he's saying is, build the temple and you will never be defeated and dispersed again. Don't build it and your enemies in the Middle East are going to destroy that land. He's not going to do it in his power. It's kind of like saying, I'm going to raise up armies against you. Well, those armies were already there and already raised. He just took credit for it. Told the Jews, I'm going to raise up armies. But he knew they're already there and they're coming after you. <laughs> he already knew. But he wanted you to fear him, and that's why he did it. And in a sense, it's his creation. He says, I am my creation. Uh, it, it is, in a sense, him doing it. You know, he's not lying. I guess is what we're get, I'm getting at, what we're getting at. So enjoy the videos, read the books, they're free right now, when they're published, buy a copy for your coffee table.